Hello Legal Eagles and welcome to a brand new topic today which is Occupier's Liability. We'll be covering two statutes for this. Firstly the 1957 Act of Parliament and also the 1984 Act of Parliament. So I've got the PowerPoint ready here. I'm just going to pop it up on the screen. And just as I said these are the first, this is the starting point that you have to have in mind, okay? So depending on the uh, exam question that you have, now remember, if it's a 30 marks question, the most that you can get on the AQA specification, then you will have to determine for yourself which statute uh, applies. Um, typically though, if it's a 10 mark question, the examiner might well narrow it down uh, to one of these and, and identify that and then you've got to support your answer you know with your um, knowledge of the law so first as I say if you haven't got this note this down the 1957 Act only applies where the person that is injured uh, on premises um, is lawfully you know allowed to be there has permission to be there uh, and then, of course, on the other side, we have unlawful, so typically thinking here, uh, people such as trespassers and, and such like that. Now, for Paper 2 tort, which, uh, which is what we've been doing so far, and this topic uh, adds to that, um, remember that everything is born out of the defendant's negligence. So here, what we're saying in both instances is the claimant... For example, under the 1957 Act, brings a claim because they were lawfully allowed on the, on the premises of the defendant, but due to the defendant's negligence, uh, they were injured. They've suffered a personal injury. Now, that negligence, typically for both, as we'll see shortly, amounts to um, not keeping that person that's uh, on your property or on your premises reasonably safe. But we'll get onto that in a minute. So, starting with the 1957 Act, uh, the starting point is this: what is often called a common duty of humanity. And because this topic, um, or this law rather, is statutory, you are going to find, unlike some of the previous topics, you'll need to be aware of section numbers to support where the law is actually found. So, uh, for instance here, under section 2, subsection 2 uh, of that 57 Act, this common duty of humanity simply means that the defendant um, has to keep all visitors on their premises reasonably safe. Now the key thing here about reasonably is um, it's not expected in the law that they have to keep them uh, absolutely safe from every eventuality. It's always, uh, you know, in terms of tort law, what is reasonable. So it doesn't mean eliminate all dangers. The first question then is in an answer, once you lay that out, once you say under the 57 Act, uh, that is the um, duty of care that the defendant should have, remember you will have to identify if the person's a lawful visitor. What will that look like in an exam situation? Well, what I've done here on the next slide is I've just got some various scenarios here. Uh, so what I'd like you to do, um, and also you have access to this resource separately if you can't see the screen, is pause the video in a moment and just ask yourself in each of these instances, I'm going to go from Trevor uh, and then I'm going Kurt, Gordon, Hannah, etc. So I'm going you know, across the way. Ask yourself, are they a lawful visitor? Um, do that now, and when you unpause the video, we'll run through the answers. Now, having done that, let's see. Trevor is a milkman delivering milk to Archie's door. Of course, Lawful Vista has a contractual agreement with Archie to deliver that milk, so there's no issue there whatsoever. Then we have Kurt the milkman picking flowers in the garden after delivering the milk. Well, he's not a lawful visitor, clearly, because a milkman should not be picking your flowers in the garden or any such thing. It's 
outside the remit of his job. Um, it's theft, really, isn't it? If we're talking criminal law, though we're not, I know, for this uh, unit. He has no license to, to do this. He's trespassing. That's right. Picking flowers on your property, this milkman. He may be able to come and go to deliver your milk, but once he or she or they do something that is, as I said, outside the remit of their job that they shouldn't be doing, trespassing. Gordon, a football fan with a season ticket, arrives at the ground on Wednesday night for a match. He's a lawful visitor. I mean, clearly there's agreement permission to be there. He has as evidence the, um, the sort of his ticket, his season ticket. Hannah regularly crosses Farmer Giles's field using a well-known public path. Again, lawful visitor has license to be there. On this occasion, it's implied to cross the land, but it's a public path. Dale jumps out of a taxi uh, at night before paying and runs onto some land before falling down a sheer drop. Not a lawful visitor at all. Um, I mean, if I just go back a second, um, yeah, completely reckless behaviour. And uh, although a taxi will, you know, clearly be able to drive you from A to B and so on, his running away, um, you know, it's removed his, his, his license there on, on that land due to his reckless behaviour. Uh, Ali is a police officer who uh, has called at Brian's house for routine inquiries. And as I'm sure most of you uh, would realise, lawful visit to the police. I mean, the police clearly have um, powers that, uh, you know, lawful powers, but also ones that society uh, it will allow them to have. And clearly as part of the job there to, to sort of... Um, ask questions and, and so forth. I mean, again, if I go back, routine inquiries, yeah. Um, doesn't need to have uh, permission to, to enter, has a, has a legal right. Although I must say, if we were moving forward from that and talking about searching the property or anything like that, then clearly the police officer would uh, need to have a search warrant and, and would need that permission from, for example, a magistrate's court. But just generally going to a property to ask questions, they are not trespassing, it's their job. Okay. And finally, Aaron, a customer, arrives at a supermarket to buy some groceries. Uh, obviously, lawful visitor, you have license permission to be there in your supermarket. Uh, that's the whole point for you to, to buy the produce uh, and go to the till. Good, so I hope you did okay with those. And that's just really to get you thinking. So in an exam scenario, particularly a 30 marks question, if you, firstly, you have to identify whether that person's a lawful visitor. And if they fall into any of the categories we've just spoken of, then clearly you know you're dealing with the Occupiers Liability Act 1957, okay? I suppose one other thing to mention, um, unlikely as it may be, it, it yeah, I suppose it's possible. You could have somebody that is, you know, a lawful visitor, a bit like we saw a moment ago with the milkman, uh, and then becomes uh, an unlawful visitor. Uh, for example, as we saw there, once they started to pick flowers in somebody's garden. Uh, so again, two could operate. Uh, it all, again, depends on, I suppose, when the injury occurs and so on. But that's, as I said, that's that's something that uh, usually it's just one or the other for one person. And if a scenario has two people, then again, you choose the right Occupies Liability Act for, for the person. OK, so uh, what, now we've done uh, or dealt with who is a lawful visitor, the next immediate question is who is an occupier? Because clearly the Occupies Liability Act, this is the person that uh, who's been injured, the claimant, would be suing. Uh, i.e. the defendant. Now, um, the occupier, according to the case of uh, Wheat and Elacon and Co. Limited, uh, they do say, firstly, there can be more than one occupier of the premises. So it can be more than one individual. And also worth noting, uh, you don't uh, have to be um, sort of like a property owner or anything like that. I mean, clearly that would be very... Uh, restrictive in the law and, 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 and would narrow the amount of claims that could be done. So 
Uh, it could be, for example, you know, if there's a tenant or someone like that. Whoever is in control of the premises at the time will do. So, for example, if someone was uh, renting or if somebody, let's think of another thing, um, I, I suppose, yeah, I mean, I guess if someone is left in charge of a house uh, whilst uh, the occupants are away, that's when the injury occurs to the uh, to the claimant. Then again, that's that's the most logical thing. So there we are. Who is an occupier? Can be more than one and whoever is in control at the time. OK, and again, in an exam situation, uh, it will be, I think, pretty obvious more often than not. Uh, the exam question scenario may not exactly say, um, but you, it's probably implied. You, you, can, you can say, you know, well, they were in control at the time, and that would be enough. That would be enough. So raise this case, mention those points, apply it to the scenario, and you're on to your next point, really. So after who is an occupier, uh, definition of premises. So we've got occupier of premises. Now, if the premises don't uh, fit within what is accepted by the law, then clearly this won't work. And again, what I would say is um, in an exam scenario, particularly a 30 marks question, this is something that uh, the examiner doesn't really uh, test you too much on. I think it's again obvious more often than not. So um, we've got this under section one, subsection three, subsection A of the 57 Act. And generally speaking says any fixed or movable structure including a vessel vehicle and aircraft uh, and just some pictures down there to illustrate some common things i guess so you've got a house or a bungalow uh, you've got a hotel you've got a caravan uh, you've got uh, land itself and in fact i suppose even any structures on that land a shed or I suppose any um, pylons, whatever it could be. If someone climbs a pylon, falls off, and injures themselves. Again, any structures on the land, uh, scaffolding. So again, uh, injuries can occur in those sort of circumstances. Somebody climbs scaffolding and falls. Um, even a lift. So if somebody is injured whilst in a lift, uh, that could apply for a claim under the Occupiers Liability Act. And the last one that I've done here, but by no means an exhaustive list, is a ship. Now, just bear in mind, um, I don't think I've put it down here, but I think it has to be a ship in dry dock, so a ship that, you know, isn't out to sea. So uh, it seems a bit pedantic, but it's um, that, that's what the law nonetheless says. Okay, so it's a ship in dry dock. More often than not, in an exam situation, it will be obvious, probably a house, a garden, etc. Okay? So, having established that the person who's injured, who's bringing a claim, is a lawful visitor, and you've said, you know, why they're a lawful visitor, you've then identified that it's this 1957 Act, you've explained what the common duty of humanity means, okay, you've said that, um, and then you've gone on to say whether or not the person that they're suing the Def, uh, defendant is an occupier well then the control of premises then yes um, were they indeed premises it may seem obvious but again you're going to say well premises can be and in this situation it is and then you just simply say you know has that common duty of humanity been breached uh, by the defendant so to keep them reasonably safe and again you might say if there is some uh, obstruction on the land or something that's particularly dangerous then that would inevitably lead to a breach there are of course and specific I think in part in, in large I should say to this topic possible defenses possible defenses for the 1957 claim that we're talking about so let's just run through um, now the first one I've got here due to an accident so the um, defendant who's being sued by the claimant who's been injured on their uh, on their premises would uh, you know the defendant could say well look it was an accident 
Uh, and just to put some context of this, we've got the case of Cole and Davis and Gilbert. Don't worry too much if you don't recall the facts of the case. As I said, um, the most important thing always, although we strive to, to investigate the facts, to learn about them and, and to remember them, uh, the most important thing is always uh, the ratio decedendi, the, the reason for the law, the law that's come out of the case. And here, clearly, if you're looking at exam scenario and it appears that it was simply an accident, then you would immediately say there's this defence, Cole and Davis and Gilbert, and, and, and you'd certainly get the marks there. So, for example, here you've got a situation where the uh, in the case the claimant uh, fractured their leg when crossing a village green. I th there was a, a, a hole in the ground where a maypole had been and uh, they didn't see it and their leg went into the hole. And that's where the fracture occurred. Pure accident, uh, the Court of Appeal, I think, established here is uh, a complete defence. Then you've got, because often uh, some of these uh, scenarios or situations may not always involve adults and when it involves children the uh, things that you need to consider are, are, are slightly different and we'll come on to that in a bit but for now oh, excuse me itchy nose but for now um, if an adult or parent should have been supervising so what we're saying here is that the claimant is a young child if this can be proven again, it will be a complete defence. So just to say in Phipps and Rochester, I think here you had this uh, five-year-old boy. I think he was with his seven-year-old sister at the time. They're by themselves walking across um, the ground uh, that they were on, this open land or whatever it was. And um, f uh, the, the young boy who, as I said, was five years old, fell into a trench and injured themselves. But it was a complete defence. The Court of Appeal agreed, you know, where is the parent supervising or an, or an adult? Why is a five-year-old and a seven-year-old by themselves walking in a field? Uh, clearly, it would be unfair to hold the um, defendant, the, the occupier of those premises, the land, at fault. So watch out for that, okay? That's something that could be a complete defence. What else? Um, occupier gives an effective warning of the danger. Now, with this topic, everyone, uh, warning signs are very relevant. Now, a warning sign could be, as you see there, something that is uh, literally visible. So, you know, it's... It's typed, it's whatever it might be, it's, uh, you know, like you see there. Or it can be verbal, all right? So it can be verbal or it can be, as we see there. Um, if an effective one, I guess it's a question for the court, but if an effective warning sign is given, this again could be a complete defence. So in Ray and Mars, uh, you had here a situation where um, an expensive surveyor uh, fell down this three foot uh, drop uh, when he entered an unlit storeroom at the defendant's factory. Uh, so, you know, where there was a warning as to that danger and it warns you quite effectively of what that danger will be and that person then becomes injured uh, anyway, then I think they really feel that uh, it would again be unfair to blame the, the occupier of those premises. What I would also add, thinking about it, excuse me, is um, again when dealing with children, we come onto this a little bit later with the 84 Act again, but it also depends on their level of understanding given their age. So clearly, I think in, in that case, an adult surveyor may be one thing, uh, but somebody that is much younger, so again, going on to the other case we said wasn't there, there was a five year old, would they really appreciate that risk? So that's really something. Uh, for you to uh, discuss and determine, and if they can't appreciate the risk, then then that, you know, I think will certainly give rise to this this uh, defence failing. Uh, there are, would you believe, more defences? 
uh, obvious danger as that sign there sort of says so the key case here is cotton and derbyshire uh, so in terms of this one here, uh, this is where uh, an intoxicated man uh, headed to a local beauty spot uh, to walk by the river. Um, they ended up, this person, falling uh, off the cliff. Then now there was a warning sign to keep to the path. Um, and the argument by the claimant was that was inadequate. So beauty spot walking by path by river they fell into fell from the, the cliff sort of edge uh, and, and injured themselves and the court here the court of appeal said well where the danger is obvious there really is no need for the occupier to actually uh, you know even give a sign really uh, and again complete defense this could be uh, we've already seen this for basic negligence and again it, it applies here but Contributory negligence, statutory defence. Uh, it's, I would say, typically it's not. It's not a sort of complete defence as we've seen, but it's the argument that's raised by the defendant that yes, they were at fault. They accept negligence to a degree, but there was also fault or negligence on the part of the claimant, and for that reason, that's why. Um, you know their injuries that they've suffered are a lot worse uh, so we've seen that for instance with the assessment we just did recently that I created where I did a scenario where there was a cyclist who was injured in a road traffic accident with a bus driven by Danny but the cyclist wasn't wearing a, a crash helmet a safety helmet and so therefore on collision with the bus their injuries were clearly a, uh, a lot worse than they would have been had they been wearing a helmet and for that reason then the judge uh, as some of you've told me in your essay answers very well the judge can then apportion damages accordingly at the end so uh, in theory it could be a 100 percent reduction it could be yes there was negligence but you're not receiving any damages but but generally speaking you know that's that i think that's quite rare i think a judge will just lower the amount of damages that uh, the claimant could receive, accepting that uh, they were at fault themselves, and, and hence that's why the injuries are, are worse. Um, and then again, consent of risk. Remembering, of course, this is something that is not allowed for road traffic accidents. Um, voluntary assumption of the risk. Uh, that's something to, to, to be aware of. I mean, certainly if there's an agreement on it, the person says oh I wouldn't go in there it's a bit you know oh it's okay I know what then that kind of thing uh, but yeah look out in scenarios is there a voluntary acceptance do they do they see a sign for instance excuse me or do they perceive a danger and choose themselves of their own free will to to just um, you know go towards it and therefore become injured and again in this instance this would be a a complete defense I think generally the courts are growing more reluctant to to use consent of risk as a defense but nonetheless for our purposes it's still law and if you see it in an exam scenario uh, it won't be explicitly mentioned remember defenses it's something you'll have to look for but if you see it you should mention it now remember I, I am whizzing through these so again as you know by now uh, if you want to pause the video at any point to you know review what's said to note anything down then please do we're going to move on again oh i forgot completely there's more defenses still excuse me i think these are the last ones though uh exclusion clauses something that um we'll be doing a lot more of in terms of paper three for aqa which is contract law but in respect of tort law uh, under section 2 subsection 1 of the 1957 Act uh, it is possible by agreement again for the defendant to uh, exclude or limit uh, any injury that the person may suffer so basically liability for any injury uh, so I guess if you get something signed before a person goes onto your premises uh, 
for instance, then then that could be a viable defence. Um, I mean, oh, just may seem obvious, but just the same. I mean, clearly, you can't exclude liability for death, uh, but here, you know, personal injury is it, certainly possible. Um, ah, yes, and I believe this is the last one, and this one is important because this is one that the examiners in uh, you know the thirty marks problem questions that you receive do sometimes include. And it's something that's not always done particularly well by students. Either they haven't revised it particularly well, uh, or it, it can be potentially more difficult for them to spot. Uh, if somebody, the claimant namely, has suffered personal injury, and they're claiming it's the negligence of the defendant, well, let's say, for instance, you're in your garden, okay, you invite somebody round, friend and you've got decking in your garden which is something that if I remember fondly used to be really big in the 90s and and, and, and particularly all those garden shows that are on TV if you didn't have decking you never lived I, I felt personally I wasn't that much of a fan but I digress and let's say the work was done so shoddily maybe it was the wrong type of wood or it was you know it was um, unknown to the defendant it was rotten or you know not installed properly so the person that's on the decking you know they walk on it uh, and their foot goes through a beam and they end up fracturing their ankle okay so they would claim personal injury for suffering it um, on the, your premises and you're in control aren't you you're occupier of your premises your your garden where the decking is if you had that installed that decking as I imagine most people would by a tradesman, you know, something like that, then clearly you're going to say the fault lies with them. And if you're going to succeed with this, and this is under section 2, subsection 4, basically putting the blame on a third party, you have to meet three tests, as I have laid out here. Um, it was reasonable to give the work to a specialist. And again, if you just take my example with the decking, um, most people, myself included, would not know, excuse me, would not know um, how to uh, install that, so it would be quite reasonable. Uh, secondly, that the person hired must be competent. Um, well, I guess there, you know, what evidence could there be? It could be, is the person qualified? Um, does the person come with, uh, you know, good rating? Have you ch have you checked them out, kind of thing? Reviewed them? Um, how many years have they been in the business, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. I mean, I suppose you go and check a trade or something like that. You clearly this this or other other places you can look. Um, then you will see that these people have to be um, regarded as qualified and competent to be you know on that directory. So again, things there, I guess, you know, uh, insurance, do they have insurance and all this kind of thing. And thirdly, and again, we have to meet all three here if this defence is to work. You as the occupier, if you're the defendant, must check the work was done properly. Now, trickier one this, I suppose going back to the decking one, you could visibly do that, couldn't you? You could uh, walk in it, you could inspect it. But more comp the more complicated the work, the more technical it is, then clearly there'll be a greater need for you to perhaps get a, a another third party in, somebody that's independent, excuse me, that can that can sort of do a visible check. Uh, how many people would do that? Again, it, I think the court's quite flexible. So it's only for really technical work. Using my example of the decking, I would think that you know visibly if it's okay and you've walked on it and so forth then that means you've checked it and so therefore if uh, a visitor to your um, premises then falls through it because as I said it was installed improperly or the wood material wasn't uh, you know the right wood or it was rotten or whatever then you would have a claim uh, against um, that third party contractor uh, and furthermore this is a complete defence then, isn't it? You're shifting the blame, the fault, to that third party. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. Uh, we're going to move on again. So to try and contextualise this and, 
and sort of develop our knowledge and understanding. Um, some scenarios, I think we'll do the first couple together and then after that uh, those activities are for you to work on with what's been discussed just now and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of, you know, email me your answers uh, as you usually do uh, by the uh, last lesson of, of the week. What have we got then? Uh, George's parents are away for the weekend. So she decides to invite some friends round to her house for a pool party. Georgia is aware that the swimming pool diving board is broken and watches as her friend Danny tries to jump from it while drunk and injures his ankle as it snaps in half. If you want to pause this video and just have a go at this one first yourself, you can do. But as I said, I'm going to go through this one with you now. Here we go. Possible claim under the 57 uh, Act. Very quickly we can pick up here. Georgia is an occupier because she's in control of the premises. The premises being the house or, or you know, or the, the, the back of the house where the swimming pool is. Uh, Danny is a lawful visitor because she invited him to be there. Um, we know the common duty of humanity is to keep visitors reasonably safe. The key thing here is she is aware, Georgia, that the diving board is broken and she does nothing. So uh, I think it's more than fair to say that Georgia has breached that duty of care and therefore uh, there would be a claim. Now, I'll just stress here, that's just really um, sort of a quick way of of sort of um, identifying an answer. When you come to write this for a 30 marks question, or indeed even a 10 marks question, you will obviously, as I've said before, have to explain the law a little bit more thoroughly, uh, give section numbers or cases, as, as we have done. But for now, that's perfectly fine. Let's move on to another. Uh, Rebecca is walking near the water cooler at her college when she slips on a large pool of water and injures her back. So again, if you want to pause the video now to uh, make your determination, I'm about to go uh, give the answer. Again, possible claim under the 57 Act. Now here, quite differently, the college, uh, presumably, you know, the college management are the occupiers. They're in control of the premises. Uh, the premises being uh, the college building uh, that she is in. She's clearly a lawful visitor there because uh, as a college... Um, actually, I guess it's implied, I didn't say, but I would say as a college student, um, which is what I meant, she would have license to be there. Um, and again, I suppose if she was a visitor to the college... She would have signed in at reception, had a visitor lanyard and badge. Then again, she, she'd be lawful. Um, has the college uh, met their common duty of humanity to keep visitors reasonably safe? And clearly here, no, that is not the case. Um, and so therefore, you know, why didn't they put out a hazard sign or whatever it is? Uh, so... If that had been the instance where they put up one of those hazard signs, you know, warning, um, floor is wet or slippy or whatever it whatever it might be, or put a like a some sort of uh, barrier around it, um, I'm trying to think what the, the words are. My, my mind's gone gone to sleep for a minute. Um, you know, like a roping or whatever, just to prevent you from getting there. Then that would have been enough. Uh, but clearly, they've not kept Rebecca reasonably safe. Okay, so once for you to actually go through yourself, so I'm not going to go through the answers now. Um, oh, excuse me. Is Bradley goes to a gig to see his favourite band. Some rigging from the ceiling, which had been installed by an independent contractor, comes loose and injures him. Is there a 1957 claim here? All right, so pause the video and uh, you know type or write down your answer. We also have Lauren pays Charlie, an electrical contractor, to replace the faulty electric wiring in her house. As Charlie is stapling some cables along a skirting board, he severely grazes his hand on a rusty nail and later develops blood poisoning. 
poor Charlie. Again, one for you to go through. So pause the video if you feel you need to there. And again, give me your answer. We now have Trisha, who is six years old, is on holiday with her parents. While staying in the hotel in a room on the second floor, she wanders onto the balcony when her parents aren't looking and falls through the railings due to her small size. Trisha breaks her leg in the fall. Robert, next scenario. Robert inherits a large house from his deceased great aunt Elvira. I think it's Elvira or Elvira, I forget. Elvira. Elvira, I'm going to say Elvira. On inspection, he realises the house is in disrepair and that there are loose floorboards. While away, a man breaks into the house and breaks their ankle on a floorboard that collapses. Thank you. Okay, so remember, they're just the first few scenarios for you to work on for the 1957 claim. We are going to move to 1984 shortly, but if you can um, approach your answers in a similar fashion to mine, and then, as I said, email them to me, okay, to check. Just an interesting news story. Uh, strange times that we, we live in at the moment with COVID-19, and we're all um, longing for you know, for it to resolve itself and things to get back to normal as quick as possible. But clearly it's been very tough, not just on a lot of people, but uh, if I narrow this story down to businesses and if we look at Disney, for example, I mean, despite the fact that they've done ever so well with uh, their film franchises that they've bought, uh, Star Wars, uh, Marvel and so on, their, the greatest bit of their income, really, is the theme parks and so forth that they have around the world. Now, with them having been shut, I think there was a statistic, I don't have it here, of, of how many sort of millions they were losing uh, at a time. But now, as the lockdown is attempting to be eased, um, we know, I think we said before when we looked at a news story, that America generally, that we share some common legal principles it's a bit more of a litigatious sort of society there uh, I think you know in terms of suing in America you're more likely to be able to sue and f for things you wouldn't be able to do so here and, and, and be successful and so businesses are very mindful to want to avoid liability so what I'm getting at here is Walt Disney World Resort will they be in, uh, you know, uh, requiring customers to acknowledge uh, the risk that COVID-19 may still present to them. So, for example, they will expect people to the theme park to be perhaps wearing face coverings, uh, to be socially distancing, uh, which is tough, I know, in, in a theme park when you're waiting for a ride or whatever it might be. But an exclusion clause, which remembered is, as we looked at before, although in UK law, uh, England and Wales law, uh, is a way to, to limit or exclude liability. And it may well be that they have visitors to the theme park now saying, as I put there, by visiting Walt Disney World Resort, you voluntarily assume all risks related to exposure to COVID-19. So in other words, defences, exclusion clause, and I guess consent. Uh, one way to avoid liability for businesses. It's interesting. Is that something that we might see here in the UK with uh, some of the uh, theme parks and, and, and other places? What about restaurants? I don't know that there may be. It's uh, something to keep an eye on, certainly. OK, um, Occupy's Liability Act 1984. Uh, what we have here then is, as we've said before, this one is broadly similar in terms of same bits amount. You need an occupier, you need premises, that will still be the case. But here the difference is that the person who's suing you, the claimant, has to be an unlawful visitor, i.e. a trespasser. Now sometimes you get news headlines like these appear. Uh, I think this one's actually in Ireland, but burglar sues shop owner after he injured his testicles while robbing the premises. And I imagine for a lot of you, it will really, you know, um, rile you up to think that such people can, can make claims. Uh, 
doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be successful but what why do we even have this law i think some of you may be thinking look if you're uh, not meant to be there if you're a trespasser uh, excuse my language it's your own bloody fault why should there be any um uh, sort of remedy for you well look children i'm not saying it's always children but a great large proportion of things certainly would, would fit in there. So you can see, can't you, we have the first one, which I think that's an adult, someone who, the sign says danger, keep out, but they're just doing it anyway. But kids, I mean, look, squeezing through the bar, uh, bars are of a fence. Um, surely the owner should be doing something about that if he or she or they are aware of that. And, and then you've got there, haven't you, um, children on their bicycles, uh, using a railway line, you know, uh, as a sort of like a, to play around on, or, or as a, a crossing, as a, as a shortcut to get to somewhere. Um, all highly dangerous. And it's a term you would have perhaps read, known as allurement. And what it boils down to is this. Um, children, young people, are more uh, attracted to risk than adults. And depending on their age... I mean, I guess the younger they are, the less likely they will be able to appreciate the risk, if you see what I mean. And I'm sure we've all got stories where when we were younger, we uh, did things or whatever that now on reflection we think that was a bit dangerous or that wasn't the best best thing to do. So, so there you go. Now, under this 1984 Act, uh, the common duty of humanity as it were the, the duty of care is slightly different and it's slightly different i think to try and balance the law insofar as um because the people or person that is on your premises shouldn't be there then um it's going to be harder for them to prove uh, uh, their claim to succeed with their claim so the duty of care on you is going to be a lot less okay it's going to be a lot less so you can see here still the word reasonable you have a duty of care to non-visitors if reasonable grounds to believe a danger exists firstly you have reasonable grounds to believe a danger exists and that the non-visitor will be in the vicinity of that danger will be near it and the law says it's reasonably expected that you offer them protection. Section 1, subsection 3. So again, it's about you having reasonable belief as to danger and knowing that you know a trespasser could, or a non-visitor could be in the vicinity of it. Uh, we're going to see in a moment, but I guess um, you're, not, you're not expected to eliminate, as I said with reasoning, you're not expected to eliminate all risk. Um, it is just what is reasonable. But if you didn't know that somebody, for example, was going to um, burgle your house, for instance, then clearly, if they were to, let's say, slip on a toy at the, t you know, uh, 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 at the top of the stairs as they're trying to make their, their sort of escape from the building, from your house, uh, then you wouldn't have any reasonable grounds to believe a danger exists and certainly more so the second one you wouldn't know you wouldn't even uh, have expected anyone to be in the vicinity of that danger so you can kind of see i think with my example where i'm going with this but we'll look at others so possible defenses so you know once you've dealt with occupier premises that duty whether you think there's a breach does the defendant here have any um possible defenses so the first one again it, it goes back to what we said before but obvious danger if there's an obvious danger then there's no expectation that the defendant ought to have done anything again a complete defense so we've got there a different case this time ratcliffe and mcconnell um i just see here it's a court of appeal case um and this is where a college student with their friends I think they were they had been drinking just prior to decided to go for a swim on the um sort of campus site so they um sort of jumped over a locked gate went into the swimming pool i mean there was there was no um uh, 
nothing like artificial lighting. It was dark. Uh, they undressed, ready to jump in the pool, and unfortunately, they, because of the darkness, failed to see that there was a sign saying, you know, the shallow end, etc., and uh, blah blah blah. And I think one of the friends, as they all dived in, one of the friends who was towards the end where it was more shallow fell in and broke their neck and I think was paralyzed so when they tried to bring a claim here because they were not allowed to be there they jumped over that lock gate uh, the swimming pool was not operating at that time um, the court of appeal said the danger was obvious it's very sad but there's no fault no liability uh, for the college also, another thing that um, sometimes comes up is worth interesting, uh, worth noting. Consideration of time and day, Donahue and Folkestone properties. Uh, again, here uh, I think this involved. Um, if I just look at my my note a second, um, I don't know if intoxication was involved here. Actually, it possibly was. A lot of the cases can sometimes be, but here was somebody that was with friends. I think going for a, a midnight swim in the sea. And they jumped off of um, sort of this this the harbour, and the tide was out. It was low tide, I should say, and they ended up like the other case, breaking their neck and I think becoming paralysed. Now the defendant uh, was aware of the fact that the harbour was used to, uh, uh, particularly in summer and, and and whatnot, when it was high tide to to jump from. Um, which usually didn't pose a problem, but he, he'd he actually employed security guards to stop people from doing this. Uh, what the defendant did not or could not have reasonably expected uh, is that people would attempt to jump off of it at low tide. Okay, um, There weren't any security guards around at that time. Again, I suppose you could say it seems like an obvious danger, but consideration of time and day, the question here was who would jump off the harbour uh, below into what was clearly a sort of dangerous situation. So the defendant succeeded with the defence by saying they'd done everything, they'd offered reasonable protection for when it was needed. And in this instance, uh, the claimant had done something that uh, no reasonable person, I suppose, could have expected. Uh, we've got Higgs and Foster here. Um, no reason to suspect a trespasser. Again, complete defence. What we have here is a police officer in their duty investigating uh, the premises of the defendant and fell into, I think it was, an uncovered pit and severely injured themselves to the point where actually they had to retire early from the force, from police service. Uh, so here the defence succeeded because the defendant, you know, had no idea that the police officer was going to be on the premises at that time, uh, and 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 really that was that was sufficient. What other defences have we got? Uh, we, well, again, consent of risk. We saw that before with Ray and Mars. So I'm not going to uh, repeat that one. If you want to go back earlier in the video, again. Contributory negligence, uh, we see that statutory defence. So much like the 1957 Act, similarly applies here. Um, and I think this is the last one. Caution, no trespassing. Occupier gives an effective warning sign. So much like the 1957 Act, warning signs, whether verbal or, or written or whatever it might be, physically, sort of there, um, will apply but interestingly um, if you just put out a warning sign or you say something then I would say under the 1984 um, act that we're dealing with here because the duty of care is much lower that um, just doing something or saying something will be enough okay it will be enough to be a defense the only time where that could be questioned as I've put there is if it's a child and I guess it's a question for the court and in this instance when you write your answer it'd be a question for you to to sort of make a judgment on uh, it will depend on the age and understanding
Now with the resources I have a bit limited at home, a uh, bit difficult to, to find the full facts of Westwood and post office, but this did involve an adult. It did involve, I think, a post office employee who um, went into a room uh, 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 and when they, the room they were not meant to go despite the warning sign and was injured um, and that was deemed to be enough but unfortunately I, I haven't got any more facts than that maybe you can can find them okay so much like before we're going to have some scenarios I think uh, I'll do the first two with you and then the other ones are for you to contemplate and uh, give me your written or typed answers along with what you've done for the 57 Act and, and email them to me so we've got here Roger a burglar breaks into Mustafa's property by smashing his living room window to break into his house while, ta uh, while taking his flat screen television off the wall he steps on a children's toy car and falls on his back spraining it the television then falls onto the burglar and breaks his nose so if you want to pause the video and consider this one I'm about to give the answer so I've got here no claim under the 1984 Act. Um, we've got here uh, Mustafa is an occupier. He's in control of the premises. It's a house, so the premises are met there. But oh, and and Roger's an unlawful visitor, so hence why the 1984 uh, Act applies. He's not been invited. He's a burglar. Um, but Mustafa does not owe Roger a duty of care. He had no reasonable grounds to believe a danger exists and that somebody would break into his house and be in the vicinity of it. So, no claim. That's the argument. We've got another one here. Uh, ben owned a long garden, at the bottom of which was a derelict garage. Uh, having seen young boys trying to get over his garden fence near to the garden, Ben placed a large notice on the fence, which stated, Danger, keep out. Later, for a bit of fun, Alan, another young boy, climbed over the fence and onto the garage roof. The roof suddenly collapsed due to its rotten condition, causing Alan to fall and rip, I think I mean his, excuse the typo, and rip his legs open on jagged tiles. So if you want to pause the video and have a go, I'm about to give the answer for this one. Possible claim under the 1984 Act. Let's just look at this for a minute. I mean, obviously... We've got the beginning, haven't we? Ben um, is an occupier. He's in control of that garden, and indeed the premises here would be the garage, because any, I think we said, fixed structure on the land would be enough. The duty of care, then. Ben had reasonable grounds to believe a danger exists. The garage, he was aware of the fact uh, having put this warning sign up as well. Uh, but interestingly, and this is something the examiner uh, tends to sort of slip into scenarios, so look out for it. Um, having seen, this is me reading this scenario again, having seen young boys trying to get over his garden fence, so he is aware. Do you see? So he certainly believes a danger exists and that they're going to be in the vicinity of it, any, any uh, non-visitors. That's the key thing. However, as I said about the warning sign, Ben has provided a warning sign. Will this be a complete defence? It's arguable. It really is. It's for you to make a judgment. Okay, The law is not always black and white. Uh, there are bits of grey. It does depend on the age of the boys and their allurement, their attraction to risk. Uh, they may not fully realise the danger. Now you'll notice in the scenario here, and it can sometimes happen, that it is not specifically uh, referred to about the age of the um, of the child. I think it's a young boy. So that's to give you scope, that vagueness in the scenario, it gives you scope to discuss the possibility here that it may or may not. I mean, clearly I think some of you would say if the person is... 14, then you'd appreciate the risk. Uh, still debatable, but I think probably most of you would say yes. Whereas if the person is 9 or 10, then that may be very different. Okay, and the other scenarios then for you to look at yourselves and, and uh, give me uh, via email your answers. 
Uh, Vin is out celebrating with friends at his local pub in Brighton, a little worse for wear as they head home at midnight. They decide to go diving into the sea from a nearby harbour owned by Vikram, a wealthy businessman. It is a well-known spot where people jump into the sea. There are no warning signs, but security guards on patrol have escorted people away. Vin jumps into the sea and breaks his neck on an underwater obstruction. Next one. Paul, a window cleaner, cleans Dorothy's windows usually every three weeks. When Paul arrives one week, he knocks on her door but finds that she is out. He cleans the front windows and then, in order to do the back of the house, climbs over her back garden fence. While there, he trips over a plant pot and hits his head on the patio, causing slight bleeding. I don't know how many uh, window cleaners do that. I know my window cleaner does that. Um, it's a bit annoying at times. Amara's home has been plagued by break-ins and burglaries. She decides to... Um, Ooh, have I done another time? But she decides to... Uh, I think I mean put out. She decides to put out anti-climb spikes on the fence of her back garden where the burglars have been climbing over. She puts a sign up on the wall on the other side that says, Caution, danger of injury from spikes on fence. One night later in the week, a burglar attempts to climb the wall but slips and impales his arm on the spike. Next one. Matt inherits a large house from his deceased great-aunt Elvira. When Matt inspects it, he finds it in disrepair. The hall staircase leading to the first floor has loose floorboards. Matt is told that local teenagers use the house to meet up and make out. Um, Matt leaves the property. Later in the week, a teenager who trespasses into the house falls through the staircase and breaks their leg. Okay. Uh, there we go, everyone. I think we've reached the end now. Uh, one thing I haven't put in there, which I think I, I, I'm right in saying I should add it, uh, there can be no claim for property damage. So we are really exclusively looking at here um, personal injury. But as I say, let me know how you get on with those scenarios and uh, email them to me if you're my students. And I think we've now come to the end, which was, I think, the largest topic we have done yet. But I felt it was important that we did the 57 Act and the 1984 Act together so you can sort of see the contrast, if you, if you see what I mean. So I'm going to end this video now. Um, thanks, everyone, and stay safe.